Welcome to the Passive Income Through Multifamily Real Estate Podcast, brought to you by Vertical Street Ventures, where we talk to top experts and seasoned investors to help provide clarity and key insights to keep you safe on your journey to financial freedom. Our goal is to help you get educated on how to create passive income for you and your family using real estate as your vehicle. If you enjoy the show, please go to iTunes and leave a rating and a written review to help us grow and reach more listeners. So the VSV2 fund we're launching here and we're really excited about it because the team has been hard at work researching funds, researching the right structure, making sure it's the right fit for our investors for the last 12 months. A lot of hard work has been put into it. And what it does for our investors is allows a lot of diversification, right? So you're no longer investing in a single asset and hoping that asset performs. We're gonna be purchasing six to 10 different assets in different markets, which gives a ton of diversification for our investors. So really excited about this and launching it to our investors. Welcome back to the Passive Income Through Multifamily Real Estate Podcast. My name is Peter Pomeroy, and I am your host. Today, we have Joseph Veery with us. Joseph is a cost segregation professional and founder of USTAGI. He has helped property owners defer or eliminate millions of dollars in income taxes by leveraging IRS-compliant cost segregation studies. Since becoming a CSP, In 2007, Joseph has performed thousands of cost segregation studies for clients in various industries, ranging from $500 million commercial properties to $50,000 single-family homes. Joseph, welcome to the show. Peter, thank you for having me on. Appreciate it. Good. All right. Well, let's um, let's get right into it. So, tell me. So, tell us um, how you got into uh, becoming a CSP cost segregation professional. Um, what your kind of path of travel was. Yeah, it, it's kind of an in- interesting story. So when I was in uh, college, I got hired on by a, a travel agency. So in my first 20 years, I'm very entrepreneurial. I really have not worked you know, for a, for a big corporation or company. And so um, I, I did work in the beginning in the travel industry, but I segued into starting my own business. And what we did is we did special interest travel. And so I worked with all kinds of entities around uh, the United States taking them on 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 travel experiences. Uh, in 2000, I sold the business and I I segued back into my 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 degree, which is business management, and I worked for the California Association of Realtors (CAR), and I was helping um, their members and um, their and the members' clients with with financial planning and um, tax saving strategies. And then, you know what happened in 2007, everything was going great. And then the car went off the cliff right. and fell over. And prior to that, about six months prior to that, I had this, this associate wanting to tell me about this strategy that he thought uh, would be very valuable. And I thought he was trying to sell me Amway soap. And so I kept blowing him off. Finally, he, uh, I said, okay, Mike, let's go to lunch. And he told me about this um, technique that um, would save income taxes. I had two clients that had big tax burdens, over $50,000. I immediately uh, helped them out with cost segregation. That's what, what he wanted to, to, to tell me about. And I ended up saving them both the $50,000. And then, of course, um, after the, the, um, the recession or depression, uh, the California Association of Realtors, their membership was cut drastically. Nobody in California was buying or selling property. And as everybody who was involved in real estate back then knows, it was pretty um it, w- it was pretty difficult to to be part of the, the real estate industry. So the owner of the company that I placed my business through for the cost segregation asked me if I'd be interested in joining his firm. And I said, yeah, I really enjoyed cost segregation. He said, you're really good at it. And I came on board. But what was really unique for, for my beginning in the industry is that I just happened, whether it's luck or maybe I created the luck, I happened to fall into um, several big clients who had a lot of cash. And when everybody was selling, they were buying. They were buying mortgages because a lot of hotels and senior centers and commercial buildings, you know, they couldn't refinance. So they were giving them the loans and then they couldn't pay back the loans. And what would they do? They they would, they would you know, have their buildings and their buildings were were throwing off huge cash flow. 
So they needed cost segregation. Right. And my my business um, growth has, has never stopped. And about six, seven years ago, I started U.S. Tax Advisors Group or USTAGI, and I've been on my own since then. That's awesome. That's a great story and, and a great um, kind of pivot uh, coming out of the, you know, 2007, 8, 9, um, you know, financial yeah. crisis. Um, so, okay. So in the tax group, so is that a, a CPA offering or what is that? Just so I'm clear, because there's a question I have down the road. No, for us you that... know what? I call it a tax group, just, just um, mm-hmm. but we're not an accountant. And that's a good, I'm glad you led into that because we are not accountants and I don't give anyone legal advice or accounting advice or tax advice. Right. Basically, I know my, my realm and my realm is based on the engineering side of doing the studies where um, I'll explain it later, but where we, 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 carve out shorter life property in in the overall um, building. It could be a commercial building or it could be a residential building. All right. Cool. All right. So with that, uh, let's get into cost segregation. What is, you know, and and many of our listeners are familiar with cost segregation, but there's, you know, going to be listeners that are, uh, it's a new concept. So let's just start with what is cost segregation? So what happens is everyone is familiar with taxable income. If you have mm-hmm. income and it's taxable income, um, the way you can reduce your taxable income is, is by expenses. And the IRS gives um, the owner of the buildings, the taxpayer, um, what, what they're telling them is that you are essentially using up your building over time. They understand that. And so rather than you know taking the, um, the expenses, like right when you sell the building, they say, okay, what you can do is you can take this, this deduction or this expense as you own the property. So don't ask me how this happened, but uh, Congress came up with for residential property, which is single family homes, and of course, duplexes and, and multifamilies, um, you, you divide by 27 and a half years. For commercial, it's 39 years. And what you're doing is you're taking the acquisition, not the value of the building when when you do the study. It's the acquisition cost, what you paid for the building. You deduct the land because land is not a depreciable asset. And you divide either by 27 and a half years or 39 years. Well, if you can imagine dividing by 39 years, you're just getting a little bit of that expense every year. However, if I point to a hotel owner and I point down at the floor and say, is your carpet going to last 39 years? You would think I, I I was you know smoking something funny. Um, obviously, carpet in a in that kind of a commercial environment, you're lucky if you get five, six, seven years. So the IRS throughout time recognizes that there are numerous hundreds and hundreds of components of the building's construction that fall into legally allowed shorter lives. So what we do as cost segregation professionals, as engineers is we're breaking out and defining the the shorter life properties. So inside the building, the shorter life property would be things like cabinets, countertops, window coverings, flooring, all except for um, for, for, um, uh, ceramic tile, that stays in -hmm. the long life. So, but we can carve out a carpet for five years, specialty lighting. Then in the outside of the building, we have land improvements. We have driveways, landscaping, pools, fencing, lighting, and all of that falls into the 15-year category. So basically what we're doing in cost seg is we're, we're, we're carving out the five and the 15-year, and you'll still have, and that's about 25%, it, very general rough. Don't, don't sure. hold me to that. I'm just using 25% as an illustration because we look at each property individually. Mm-hmm. So when I say about 25%, if you have a warehouse, we're not going to find 25% because a warehouse basically is four walls and a, and a roof. There is a lot of personal property, a lot of land improvements, but on a, on a warehouse, you're going to get more like 20%. But let's just use 25% mm-hmm. for the math. So if we carve out 25%, um, you can, um, in, in the shorter life, you'll be able to accelerate that part of the building and take it as a, de- as a deduction. Right now, we're in the last year of 100% bonus. And right. by that, I mean tax year 2022. So if you filed your 22 taxes, the 100% is off the table. You're now into the 80% when you file your 23 taxes. But let's, a lot of my clients are on extension anyway. So let's just use 22. So for 22, you have 100% bonus depreciation. What does it mean? It's very simple. It means any life of a building component that is 20 years or less, you can deduct 100% of that in the tax year you do the study. 
So if you're it's still doing a, a 22 tax return, basically, and I find 25%, if we use general math, let's say you buy a, a multifamily for $1.2 million and 200,000 is land, you have a, a, a million dollars in the building basis. And so if I find 25%, All of that $250,000 you can deduct in your taxes in 2022. So it's huge. But but one thing I I really have to tell you, Peter, is I don't use 100% bonus as a selling tool. My my competitors do. I don't because I started in 2007 and we didn't have 100% bonus. So to me, it's a moot point. All it is is a great timing benefit. So if you get 100% this year, wonderful. But next year, you're going to get 80%, and then you're going to get trails on the 20%. So you're still going to get it. You're just going to get it over time. Right. All right. So let me um, understand something. In the the first, like just like kind of standard cost segregation where you are identifying the components and, you know, let's just as an example, say, let's say carpet is five years and let's just for kicks, I'm sure I'm, I'm incorrect, but, you know, let's say carpet is five years and counters are seven years, right? If I own a property, pro- yeah, yeah. go ahead. It, right, I'm sure those numbers are wrong, but just for for yeah. my like yeah. simplicity sake, so I buy the property and I sell the property at the end of year five. So the um, the carpet right that has fully depreciated because that has a five year life, and so there's no risk of recapture on that. And then the the uh, counters or whatever that's seven years. I've I've only depreciated this, you know, five years of the seven years. So I'm actually I'm okay. It's not like I owe something back. Whereas in the bonus depreciation, my understanding, and it could be wrong, is that I've taken all of those items under the 20 or 25 years and I've kind of boosted them up to year one, taken all of that depreciation. And now depending on when I sell the property. I may or may not have a kind of a, a, a recapture tax, which I know there's some ways to deal with that at that point in time. But is that generally correct? Or am I uh, mixing yes it up? Yes and, and, and no. Again, I'm not the accountant, but mm-hmm. when it comes to depreciation recapture, I, I believe, and again, I could be wrong, but I believe right. bonus depreciation has nothing to do with, with recapture. So okay. if you're going to take all of that depreciation expense mm-hmm. uh, in the year 2022, you're going to take all of it. But the, the the depreciation recapture tax is 25%. And so let's use my example. If you have $250,000, um, you're going to have to pay 25% of that back when you sell the build, building in five years. Right. However, you brought up a very unknown fact. And I'm, I'm shocked that you brought it up because this is one of the, the, the aha moments for a lot of the listeners is that you brought up a concept that a lot of my very talented accounting um, partners uh, use. And they they make the argument, it's like buying a laptop. You buy a laptop five years ago for $2,000. What is that laptop worth five years later? It's worth a residual value, parts, because it's worth nothing, except maybe somebody can come up with a value, $200 on eBay or $150 on eBay. So my accounts come up with the same um, concept with, with cost segregation, because we broke out the five, seven, and 15, we know that of the five-year property, after five years, it's only worth the residual value. That comes off the table for depreciation recapture. So a lot of objections to cost seg, they used to be depreciation recapture, where the accountant would go, oh, well, well you got depreciation recapture, so why would you want to do that anyway? Well, the answer is, if you are smart and you tell the IRS that all of your five-year property now is off the table, right? And, all, and a third, or, or a third of your fifteen-year properties off the table. You've just saved yourself a big windfall in the depreciation tax, right? Right, and and that's kind of where I was going in my muddled way, because the cost segregation, you know, put bonus depreciation over here to the side for a minute. The cost segregation is pretty straightforward. It's like you know, this is has a life of three years and five years and seven years, and if you Yep. Own it for three years or five years and seven years. You've, as you're, as you're saying, like it's off the table. So you use it up. It, yeah. It's gone. I mean, it's like that laptop. It's yeah. not worth anything. Now you you should be smart enough to come up with a residual value. Right. I would Fair push enough. the yeah. button and say zero. I mean, come on. So right. out of your, I find thirty thousand dollars in five years. I just made the number up. Right. I would say that your thirty thousand dollars now maybe worth twenty eight or or something. And and somebody can give the accountant a good number right. for that, but it's not me. 
Right. And that's, and that's again, where, you know, to your point earlier, you know, your, your accountant, your CPA is a partner in this process. So, um, you know, connect with them. All right. So in terms of like the steps, okay, let's, you know, I've got a, you know, whether it's a, a single family home, and I assume it's a single family home that's for a rental property versus something I live in as my main Correct. dwelling. Yeah, the, or... the primary residence is, is not depreciable. Okay. And versus, uh, and then also, you know, um, you know, a multifamily property. What are the steps? It's like, you know, I buy this thing. I'm like, oh, I think I should do cost segregation on that. What, 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 what do I do first? Well, first of all, let's go through the three uh, reasons why you wouldn't want to do cost segregation. Because there's only, there's only, well, I come up with three. There's, right. there's a lot, but, but, but the three major ones are number one: Are you paying income tax? So if your accountant is not telling you to write a check to the IRS, then you don't need cost segregation. Don't call Joe. I don't right. need to talk to you. I'm not going to take your money because I'm going to tell you you don't need to do cost seg. A lot of people don't really understand income taxes and they don't get it. But if they tell me I'm not paying an income tax, don't do cost seg. That's number one. Number two is because of depreciation recapture, even after we spoke about it, if you're not going to hold the property for at least a year and a half, then I would say, again, if you're a flipper, right. don't. Do do cost segregation. Okay. So um, so those are are are, are some of the um, major reasons why you want wouldn't want to do do cost segregation. So if you get on the phone with me and I go through and and make sure. Oh, the other reason why you may not want to do cost seg, and um, I, I'm going to be very guarded on this because I have a lot of these these individuals that do cost seg. If you are a passive investor, and I'm not the accountant, so I'm not going to give you passive investment rules. But you might want to look at the deductions because if you own a million dollar building and you have a severe cap on your depreciation expense you can take as a passive investor, then you may not want to do it. However, I've got a ton of passive investors because what happens with passive investors is the the amount that you don't use if you have a cap on your depreciation is a net operating loss that carries you forward for as long as you need it. So that's why I have a lot of passive investors. But that's the third reason. If if you have a big building and you're a passive investor, you may not it may not be feasible to do it. But let's say now you satisfy all three re- requirements. What you do is you call somebody like U.S. Tax Advisors Group. We give you a no cost analysis. All I need is is, is uh, answers to some basic questions. What's the address of the property? What did you pr- pay for the property? And when did the property close? That's all I need because I will do the rest of the work and I will look up the profile of your property to find out, you know, how big it is, uh, what the construction looks like. You know, do you have a swimming pool? Do you have a clubhouse? Is it a, is it a single family home on an acre lot? Is it a single family home on no lot at all? Like in downtown Philadelphia, right. there are no land improvements because there's no lot. Right, <laughs> so right, right, that's, right. So that's you can start really... to break it up pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically we do this no cost analysis. And then I will give you the fee. Now, you hit the nail on the head, though. We do single family homes, which we are one of the few that do single family homes. And we are one of the few that do the single family homes, all of the work for the client. I still need a little, I still need information, but you know, I'm not going to need to fly to the, to the, to, to the site and, and we're going to do an analytical study. And by the analytical studies, I'm going to gather the information. And I'm going to use, our engineer is going to use an analytical uh, approach to doing the study without having to fly there. So that means that the cost of the study is affordable, even for a $50,000 single family home. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That, that's great. All right. I want to, um, so we, we, we hit a number of my questions here, which is great. Well, I want to hit, which is one other one. I mean, you mentioned like in your bio that, you know, the 50,000, 500 million, the 500 million, like I get that. The, I mean, is there, um, was there kind of a like not a sweet spot? But I just want to hit again the like I buy a you know at what at what point from a dollar value at an acquisition does it start to make sense to consider cost segregation? And let's assume it's a five year hold. Yeah, I would still it, say that's probably up to to the the individual owner. But right. I would say probably if you wanted to make me say, I would say. A building with, um, because don't forget, land is included in the acquisition. So right. I would say probably minimum would be a seventy five thousand dollar building. Okay. Yeah, and then yeah. the up, upper range is like you said, it's unlimited. I've done five hundred, uh, five hundred um, million dollars. Right, right. It was a a, a a a city block 
in wow. downtown San Francisco by Union oh, Square. Nice. That must. I mean, that's a huge, I, huge, huge, huge project. Project. Yeah. But then, but then you're going to get a lot of value for for like a million dollar. You know, like I just gave you right. the example. If right. you buy a one point two million dollar multifamily and I give you twenty five two hundred and fifty thousand. Yeah. Oh my God, that that's is a, a deal. that's going to have a really great value proposition because our fees have come way down from when I started. When uh-huh. I started, it was it, just just the big big property owners, but nowadays because we're using automation so much, the the, the fees structures come way down. So there really is not a property that I would would be afraid of 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 at least giving you a quote. Sure, but sure. Probably it's going to be worthwhile right. to do. Right. Okay. Um. In terms of COVID, uh, you know, and and any kind of recovery related to to COVID, and I'm fishing, and I'll tell you exactly where I'm fishing. Um, just to ask the question: Is are there opportunities today to, you know, through your services, um, you know, find depreciation or or something that and make an argument that oh, COVID has has had a longer impact on my business, but you know, my property business. Are there op- opportunities in that space? And if not, um, if there is something else that comes our way, and it could be, you know, who knows what it is? I know it's very speculative where I'm going, but you know, what should an investor like have their eyes and ears open to? And I guess the easiest would be to call you, um, so that they don't miss an opportunity. If like you know, in, in, that might benefit them as it relates to reducing their tax burden well and- uh, that's a great question but as far as the COVID, unfortunately i don't know of any advantage or mm-hmm. any impact COVID had on on my world which is okay. income okay. taxes and cost seg but there is something that everyone should know about if you're a value add type of investor what do value add investors do they buy a crappy little property or, or multifamily mm-hmm. whatever and they fix it up and then you know they they could even flip it could be because i'm going in now in a different direction so let's say they they, they 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 improve the property. There is something out there that be, has become very important as, as another type of study we do, which is called energy tax saving studies, which is 45L. Mm-hmm. And, and if you do the improvements, most likely you're going to increase the uh, energy efficiency enough to qualify. So we, again, do the, do the same thing. We'll do a no-cost estimate to let you know and and what are we looking for? Well, obviously, the number one major impact is the HVAC system. So I will tell you right now, if you added or, or replaced the HVAC system and you replaced it with a decent system, you can't go super cheap because then it's not going to be energy efficient. But if you get a 14 SEER or a 15 SEER, you're probably going to qualify because it's pretty rare that you just do the HVAC. But if you do the HVAC system, then we we will probably find some other improvements you've made, like maybe in the light fixtures, maybe in the um, insulation, maybe in the roof, maybe in the windows, maybe in the doors, maybe in the water heater, maybe in the heat pump. And we combine those all together the, the tax credit going back in time is $2,000 per door. Right. So single family home, $2,000. If you have 10 units, you're going to get $20,000. For each door, you're going to get a $20,000. And it's a tax credit. It's not a, uh, it, it's, it's not a, and, and it's, it's not an expense. So what's the difference? The tax credit means that you're going to take $2,000 per door off of your, your tax bill. Yeah. It's not an expense. Deal. It's a $2,000. And so that's powerful. In 2023, it jumps up to $2,500. Okay. So, and- so if you're a value add or you've done any energy improvements, you know everybody should be circling back and thinking because these tax credits are really, really important. They're powerful and they changed the rule um, in September to make them um, long lasting, meaning now it's a 10 year process where before it was year by year by year. So nobody wanted to wait for Congress to 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 re-up it. Now it's in the code for 10 years. So that's one thing that everybody should think about looking into is the energy tax credits. Yeah. I'm, I'm, and I'm glad that you brought that up. And I'm glad you brought that up in the context of value add. I've, he- I've, I've heard of that before. Maybe it was, it's a different like tax number or something, but the, thematically, as it relates to new development, new construction, and the, the the value of putting in these energy efficient like you know systems, but now if you have new construction, I would be shocked if you're not already energy efficient, and you're right. still going to get the two thousand dollars, twenty five hundred dollars per door with new construction. It's it, and and by the way, um, here's the the big big takeaway from this: 
I mentioned a year and a half to two years hold for cost segregation. For energy tax credits, you could go back three years and get that credit. What's that mean? If you did the work three years ago and you sold the building three years ago, wow. you still qualify for that tax credit. Wow. So you have that's a lot a, of a, flippers out there that yeah. are sitting on a cash, tons of money. They don't even know that they can go back three years and do this. Right. I mean, that's a way to make your investors happy. And I'm glad I'm glad that you brought it up in the con again in the context of value add, because so many of our listeners are doing value add. And they're, you know, they're probably putting in these improvements that oh, um, would yes. allow them to have a tax credit. And now what you're saying yeah. is, yeah, you can go back in time. Yeah. Um, all right. Last um, last couple of questions. These kind of broad questions. Um, uh, what, what are like the most kind of common incorrect assumptions that investors might have about, um, you know, the, about, you know, why they don't want to give you a ring that you might yeah. come across and how do you respond to them? Uh, you know, I've been doing this for so long. I have an actual misconception sheet of like 22 misconceptions. And believe it or not, there's still a lot of people out there that believe these misconceptions. But I'll give you a couple. Number one would be, um, I, I can only do it on new construction. I only can do it on a property I bought in the current tax year. No, I can go back 15 years and make cost seg work. So th it's a little bit more work, meaning that I have, we have to look at how much depreciation you took over those 10 years. Let's say 10 years. And then how much is my fee? And then figure out, is the acceleration enough to, to, to justify doing cost seg? My rule of thumb, and, and this is just Joe's own brain, is I like to give my investors 10 times the fee. So if I charge you $500, I want you to save 5,000 in taxes. Now you can do what you want, but for me, if you meet that 10 times, then, then I think that's a good value proposition and you should consider um, looking at, at doing cost segregation. So that's one of the um, one of the misconceptions is I can go back and I, I do this individually because it's it's not 15 years, but it's about 15 years. So I'll look at each property separately. And if the numbers don't work, I'll tell you, hey, I wouldn't do this. Don't do it. But yeah. that's one 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 big misconception in doing cost segregation. Um, we also talked about doing the um, uh, well, there's another one. There is, okay, what about, a we talked about depreciation recapture. That's off the table. I explained right. it already, that, that cost seg definitely reduces depreciation right. recapture. Doesn't, does, it's not a, a, a misconception. It's a total misconception. So yes, that's one that needs to come off the table for, for um, clients. Um, as far as, I, I think I've already answered this, as far as the value of the property, a lot of uh, owners, right. because the old days thought, oh, I have to have a $10 million building. Right. I've already told you, no, you right, can have a single right. family home. So it's worth, I mean, I mean, not to pitch your business, but it, I would say it's worth at least the call to have a conversation with you. And, and yep. um, um, all right. So the last question, final question here. So look, and it's not a particularly fair question, but that's all right. Um, so from my perspective, at least, um, so a little more delicate. So I'm a passive investor. We, you kind of got at this a little bit earlier. I'm a passive investor, like, you know, three passive investors in a, um, you know, maybe a kind of medium sized syndication. There could be like 15 or other like passes or 20 other passes. Um, and the invest, the sponsor has not done a uh, cost segregation study. And this is taking you out of your realm of actually whatever. Um, what advice would you give to those passive investors to try to like encourage the sponsor to consider a, a, a reluctant sponsor to consider doing a cost segregation study? And truthfully, you kind of just best, answered it, but still. I've got really talented people on my mm -hmm. team. I would say get the sponsor on a phone call with me. I'm, I don't try to sell anybody anything. I'm a, I'm an educator. Yeah. So I would have him get on the phone because there's really no reason to do it uh, unless the accountants step in and say that it doesn't pencil out for the passive right. investor in this situation. I'm all into that. I would say don't do it. If the accountants say no, but I would just get on the phone with me, get an estimate. Have everybody take the estimate because what happens in the investment is everybody gets the, the the pie of depreciation sliced up to how much they own. So you can't trade it. You can't sell it. If right. you own 10%, you're going to get 10% of, of the accelerated depreciation and you can't give another partner 5% of your 10. That's not how it works. Everybody has to do cost segregation. It's not, oh, I want to do it, but the, no. 
the whole building must be segregated. So I would get me to do an estimate at no cost. We don't charge for our estimates. Right. And then what I would do is I would take it to the tax professionals and say, hey, Joe's going to give us X. I have 15 passive investors that own this percentage breakout. Do you think this is a play that we want to do? Should we do cost segregation? Right. And and I would just take my information and find out if, if, if it's if it's the right viable plan. Right. Awesome. Joseph, thank you for coming on the show. If listeners would like to get a hold of you, what is the best way for them to do that? Uh, it's easy. U.S. Tax Advisors Group Incorporated. But again, U-S-T-A-G-I, U-S-T-A-G-I.com. And they will get the they will get the information on how to you know give me a call or email me and also there'll be a um a, a form they can fill out if they want to get a no cost estimate. Awesome. And for those of the listeners that would like to connect with me or would like to be on the show, please feel free to shoot me an email at peter at verticalstreetventures.com or uh, reach out on LinkedIn. And as always, please consider subscribing to the show. And if moved, please leave a five star review. So we can continue to have terrific guests like Joseph Vieri share their insight with us. And with that, thank you all for listening. And I wish you a terrific week. Thank you, Peter. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please go to iTunes and leave a rating and written review to help us grow and reach more listeners. Subscribe too, so you can get the latest episodes. Lastly, to stay updated, head on over to verticalstreetventures.com. If you're interested in learning more about what we do, you can schedule a call with our team on the website. Thanks again for joining us. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode.